Our scripture reading this morning is Romans 12, verses 6 through 13 from the New Revised Standard Version. It can be found on page 162 in the New Testament portion of the Pew Bible. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Debbie Houghton, the Director of Adult Faith Formation here at FUMC. And I'm so happy to welcome you this morning to our church's celebration of Juneteenth. I'm also so excited to introduce a special speaker in our pulpit today. Dr. Versha Pleasant is a clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology who specializes in cancer genetics and breast health. She also has a master's degree in public health from Yale University. And before she entered medical school, she completed an HIV AIDS program management fellowship for the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention in Rwanda and Cote d'Ivoire where she worked among vulnerable populations with HIV and AIDS. She finished medical school at Georgetown University, completed her obstetrics and gynecology residency and cancer genetics fellowship here at Michigan Medicine, and is now the director of the Cancer Genetics and Breast Health Clinic at Von Voigtlander Women's Hospital here in Ann Arbor. She is deep, deeply interested in health disparities, particularly in breast cancer and genetic testing barriers facing black women. She's here today to share her thoughts about Juneteenth and to encourage us to keep looking for ways to counteract systemic racism in our community and our country. Versha is a blessing and a reminder to us that we believe in a God of love and justice. May her words spark us to continue the work that is so needed to further God's love and justice for all God's children. Versha Pleasant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. And Reverend Nancy Lynn, Reverend Tim Cobbler, the First United Methodist Church, Methodist Church of Ann Arbor, I want to express my extreme gratitude for this opportunity to speak to you all today. I want to preface by saying that these remarks are my own. They're not representative of any institution or organization. And I would like to open with a prayer if we can bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you tremendously for the opportunity, the honor, to speak to your people today. 
Give me the words and the wisdom to speak on this difficult topic in a way that is pleasing to you and that it is received with open minds and open hearts. This I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. The title of my talk today is The Left-Handed Desk. Stop sitting in the left-handed desks. What? You have to stop sitting in the left-handed desks. Terrence, my boyfriend at the time, and I were chatting during the short break in between our medical school classes. In my normal fashion, I was late to class. I slipped into the first seat I could find on the end of a row. Listen, I was late, give me a break. Yes, but what if a left-handed person comes to class looking for a seat, like me, he asked. Well then, they and you can sit in all of the many other seats that are open. I waved my hand across the sea of mostly empty seats in our lecture hall. Who cares about the stupid desk, I thought. Every day was the same. I would slip into class late, ease into whatever first available seat I could find, which was usually a left-handed desk at the end of the aisle, and see my boyfriend give me the same look of playful disdain. When I asked him one day why that seat was important, his answer was immediate, almost rehearsed and entirely too long as if I wasn't the first person he had to explain this to in his lifetime. Because if you sit in the right-handed desk as a lefty, then you smear your work, you have to arch your hand so that the side of your palm doesn't drag across what you already wrote, and then your left arm is in the air, not supported by the desk, and on and on. An event that stands out in my mind occurred one afternoon following class. Terrence and I went to our pharmacology teacher's office hours to review medications for which we still had lingering questions. Dr. Jones, as I'll call him, had a small office that was stacked high with books upon books with very little space to move. Within minutes, however, the room was stuffed with medical students with their hands raised, asking questions and scribbling notes. As Dr. Jones continued on to explain the next medication, he paused suddenly and said, I don't mean to get sidetracked, but I have to mention this. Everyone leaned in in suspense. I just noticed that Versha is the only right-handed person in this room. Immediately, the room roared with agreement and excitement as each person turned to one another, smiling and sharing stories, agreeing that they had noticed the same thing too. Everyone in the room noticed it but me. It was as if a sort of sigh of relief went through the room, as if it was their first time ever in life to bond with one another, to recognize their collective struggles, to laugh, to understand something that is so deeply and profoundly impacted every aspect of their lives. But at that time, I was annoyed. What was it with these left-handed people? Was it really that big of a deal? Was it really worth mentioning? Fast forward years ahead, Terrence and I graduated from Georgetown Medical School, matched at the University of Michigan for residency, got married, and then moved out to Michigan shortly thereafter. What a whirlwind. I began my training in obstetrics and gynecology, and Terrence in otolaryngology had a neck surgery. We were excited to embark on this new chapter in our life together. The days became a blur of work, studying, reading, and practicing our surgical skills. I remember one day suturing and tying knots with Terrence at the kitchen table. Terrence, when did you learn to use your right hand to suture, your left handed? He gave me that look again, the one he frequently gave me when he was about to break the protective covering of my naivete. Versha, I can operate with my right hand, but why would you do that? because all of the surgical instruments are designed for right-handed people. And practically all the attending surgeons are used to working with right-handed residents, so sometimes they don't know what to do with the left-handed people. Like being left-handed, you have to stand on the other side of the table. It changes everything. I've trained myself to operate right-handed. It's just easier that way. It took me a minute. It never dawned on me that there was a handedness to the surgical instruments that I used every single day to stitch, tie, and close up bodies. I never bothered to think that these tools that I put in my hands were designed specifically for me, 
but excluded a whole other group of people in this world who then must acquiesce, who must expend additional energy to train their brain to think the way a right-handed person would to adapt in order to operate both literally and figuratively, to seek out the few desks made for them in a room full of thousands, only to find a right-handed person cluelessly sitting in it. Trying to use a pair of surgical scissors to cut using my left hand for the first time felt nearly impossible. And as a side note, I would strongly encourage all of you to do this at home if you're right-handed. Over time though, over the course of my training, I learned the intricacies of the pressure in one's palm that when placed in the right area, the scissors can cut quickly through a tied suture. But when these areas of pressure are not recognized by the user, what would be a swift cut could instead end in multiple sad attempts, suture still intact, frayed ends, and even a bit of public embarrassment. So I just had to research the left-handed world for myself. Let me share with you some interesting facts that I found. 10% of the American population is left-handed. While left-handedness in many traditions may be a positive thing, among the Incans they were thought to have spiritual powers. In many Western cultures, it has historically had negative connotations, being seen as malicious. Children then and even now are sometimes forced to write with their right hand if seen writing with their left. I personally lived abroad for many years, and in most countries in which I worked, the left hand was the bad hand for which you were forbidden to touch food or shake hands. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I had a man refuse to take money from me when I was paying for an item because I was handing it to him with my left hand instead of my right. There is data to suggest that left and right hemispheres of the brain are better connected with improved coordination in left-handed people. Here are some items that we use on a daily basis that are designed specifically for right-handed users. Can openers, most important buttons on cameras are on the right side, tape measure, computer keyboards, card terminals have the card swipe on the right side, zippers on pants. A Harvard study reported that left-handed people earn on average 10 to 12% less income every year than right-handed people. Some famous left-handed people include President Barack Obama, President George H.W. Bush, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Jimi Hendrix, who often played his guitar upside down, as most guitars are made for right-handed people. Babe Ruth, Bill Gates, Albert Einstein, Mozart, Henry Ford, Helen Keller, Oprah Winfrey. These individuals, just like Terence, had to work hard to overcome the odds that were stacked against them in a world that in no way made any accommodations for them. They can and do adapt out of necessity. I decided then and there to recognize my privilege. Yes, I'm a black woman in the United States. I am no stranger to exclusion, discrimination, microaggressions, bias, racism. But this is one of the few times in my life as a black woman where I can talk about my privilege, my right privilege, as I finally confront the facts that this world was designed by people like me for people like me. I did not realize my right privilege until Terrence called me out on it and forced me to confront it. Even despite this harsh reality, I decided that Terrence's stories in my mere Google search while well-intentioned, could not be the extent of my effort to recognize the tough reality of left-handers. I had to go further, dive deeper, so I look. I look for opportunities in my environment to recognize left-handers and acknowledge their struggle. I operate very frequently with trainees whose handedness I would routinely overlook. Now, I actively watch for it and take notice of their dominant hand. I then ask them which side of the operating table they are most comfortable or which hand they would prefer to suture with. Sometimes that means standing in a position that I may not prefer. Sometimes it is one that makes me slightly uncomfortable. Perhaps though it makes no difference at all which side of the table they stand on if the instruments, these right-handed instruments, are still biased. While all of that is true, I would argue that we should not and cannot wait until our environment is perfect to make a difference because perhaps it may never be. We have to strive to fight, to struggle, to do what is right, right now, amidst the imperfection. 
I hope you can see where I'm going with this story. Today is Juneteenth. While officially called Juneteenth National Independence Day, there are a few other names by which it is known. Jubilee Day, Freedom Day, Black Independence Day, Emancipation Day, and America's Second Independence Day. And as such, with its multiple names, it also has multiple meanings. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed black slaves in the Confederate States but its implementation depended on the advancement of Union troops and was not immediately widespread. In 1865, however, Union Army General Gordon Granger publicly announced General Order No. 3, the emancipation of black slaves in Texas, which was the furthest, most southern state in the former Confederacy, for which there were still over 250,000 slaves still in bondage and totally unaware of the creed that was put forth two years prior. This order stated the following, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The day of this declaration in Texas fell on June 19th, for which the words June and 19th combine to create the name for this historical holiday. This day represents freedom, but not just physical freedom, but a liberation that comes from an acknowledgement of these two opposing concepts, both the physical and metaphorical oppression of slavery, Jim Crow, bias, discrimination, microaggressions, racism, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, Emmett Till, but also the joy of black American culture in spite of and in some way birthed from those very things. The food, dance, music, literature, cuisine, poetry, artwork, philosophy, the culture of entertainment, hip hop, jazz, blues, gospel, science and discovery, Phyllis Wheatley, Maya Angelou, Stevie Wonder, Sojourner Truth, Nia Simone, W.E.B. Du Bois, Charles Drew, Alice Ball. I can go on and on. It's a celebration of two warring beasts, one with the weight and largeness of slavery and centuries of physical and psychological debasement, and the other being the grandeur of the hope, love, and joy that is not only just as great, but greater, bigger, stronger. The legacy of slavery, no matter how great, can never surpass the enormity of beauty and strength in black culture that it took to overcome it. Blacks not only lived and still live in an environment not designed for them, but moreover, it was historically engineered to maintain their bondage, subjugation, oppression, and failure. And despite this, black Americans have managed to overcome, surmount, and surpass, and that calls for a celebration. As I mentioned before, though, we cannot deny the reality in which we live. Racism exists. Hate exists. Racial violence exists. On a daily basis, what can we do to counter it and address it? It can feel exhausting at times for both the black person that is the target of racism and the white person that is trying to be anti-racist in a very racially charged society. An answer is found in one of my favorite passages in the Bible, the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, 25 to 37 of the New International Version reads, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. 
but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a good neighbor to, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is a really, really important passage for what we are commemorating today. First, I want to start with the expert in the law who clearly knew the answers on paper, but didn't actually know how to implement it. Don't we sometimes find ourselves in that situation where we want to do good, but we don't know the details of how to go about doing it? Black Lives Matter has become the go-to refrain of our daily life to show the world we care. There are t-shirts, there are bumper stickers, buttons, posters. This is great, but I want to challenge us to go further. What does that statement really mean to you? How does that phrase translate to reality? Let's go back to the story and see. There's a man lying on the road, naked, beat, half dead. He is passed by several people, including a priest, which if you're ever passed over by a priest, things must be pretty bad. We don't know where the priest or the Levite were headed. Maybe the priest was headed to church. Maybe the Levite had an engagement and he was going to be late if he stopped. While the scripture doesn't say what they were thinking or where they were going, you could assume what they may have been thinking based on how they reacted. Maybe, I don't have time for this. Or, how am I really going to be able to help him? Or, what does helping him cost me? Or maybe, what did he deserve? What did he do to deserve this? Maybe he's getting whatever he deserved. What if he wakes up and hurts me? Clearly God has punished him. Why should I get in the way of that? Not only did these individuals pass by, but they made it a point to cross the street. They wanted to be as far away from the drama as possible to maintain a safe dif distance from what uncertainty and discomfort may have come with this gentleman and continue with their plans for the day. But then we see that despite of having been passed by others, the Samaritan stops and takes pity on him. While sympathy was already way more than the other passerbys had felt, is pity truly enough? What benefit would it have been to the man if the Samaritan had pity on him but kept on his merry way? Instead of just feeling pity on him, the Samaritan bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and put the man on his own donkey. He used his own possessions to help this man. He then proceeded to put him up in a hotel and took care of him. Then it says the next day, which implies that he stayed the night with this man to tend to him. We don't know much about the Samaritan. We don't know who he was or what he did for a living, but one thing is for sure. He was someone who was on the lookout for opportunities to do good even if it required his discomfort or disruption of his plans. Black Lives Matter is not just in the streets at traffic stops. It's in the boardroom, in the jail cell, in the college Ivy League classroom, in the doctor's office. Their lives matter when everyone is looking on a cell phone video recording and their lives matter also when no one is looking behind a closed door. I often tell others that it's easy to protest but the much harder, more sustainable work is what needs to be done afterwards. They involve job recruitment, access to educational opportunities, career advancement, and medical equity. I challenge you to look for opportunities in your environment, your school, your workplace, your job, your home, your local community, where you can do something small or large to help those in the black community. There are always opportunities to get involved. It's just a matter of whether we choose to see them or whether we decide to cross the street. Jesus' words literally were, go and do. 
The Good Samaritan truly went above and beyond. On top of helping the stranger, he also went the extra mile to set him up for success when he woke up. He gave the innkeeper money for his care and made a promise that he would come back the next day too. We can help by making promises to commit ourselves to works of love, justice, and equity in our communities. Not just by the words we use, but our actions and sustainable commitments to help create equity. If you're a scientist, are there blacks working in your lab? Have you tried to actively recruit any? If you're a teacher, do you notice a black student who is struggling in your class? And have you investigated why? If you're an artist, do you have any programs that allow for budding black artists to be represented? If you're an executive, are there blacks at the table when big company decisions are being made? These are just a few thoughts demonstrating how the need for racial equity, inclusion, and representation of blacks that permeates all areas of our society and can be addressed if the commitment is there. I don't think it's a coincidence that today also happens to be Father's Day. I reflect on the things Terrence has taught me and how he is now an amazing father to our beautiful children, Zuri and Zara. I'm excited about the life lessons he will teach them just as he has taught me. I also think about our Heavenly Father and how he can and does nurture a spirit of love and service in us if we allow him to, as he challenges us to be more understanding and compassionate in the way that we think, act, and exist towards others. I want to challenge all of you today to think about the left-handed desk in which you may be sitting. Perhaps in a place of cluelessness or wanting to help but not knowing how, I implore you today to do your research, listen to people's testimonies, seek out the information you need, and then once you have that knowledge, do, act. Find opportunities to be a blessing to the black community in light of and in spite of the world in which we live that may encourage you just across the street and continue with the status quo. We have, the, we have to challenge ourselves to be better, to reflect constantly on what we say and do, to act with love and intentionality to both confront the dark history of this country, but also to work towards painting a better future for black communities. Today, we can and must get up. Thank you very much. God bless you all.